title of my uh, little presentation today was the, the birth pangs of early modern print, 1450 uh, to 1520. And I really just wanted to start with uh, an image of an early modern book. Uh, the book itself is of no uh, particular significance. I, I chose it at random uh, in the library. Uh, and I suppose that's what's important about it, in that I took it off at random, uh, and yet even here it's from the 1640s. Uh, and even after more than 400 years, it's still recognisable as what we call uh, a book. It has all the uh, apparatus that we expect uh, of a book. It has, as you can see, a, a title page. Uh, it has a preface, uh, a dedication, uh, an introduction. Uh, it has footnotes, it has an index, and it even has uh, covers which we can uh, recognise uh, as book covers. And I suppose the lesson of that is that we've learned that if something looks, feels, and smells like a book, uh, ergo, uh, it is a book. But in this presentation, I want to think about aspects of the change around 1450 from medieval manuscripts to printing uh, by movable type. And also in that context, uh, think about the change within the past decade or decades uh, from the world of printing uh, on movable type uh, to the world of uh, electronic uh, communication, I suppose, uh, to use a cliche, uh, from the world of uh, Gutenberg uh, to the world of, uh, world of Google. And I want to suggest in uh, some ways very uh, haphazardly uh, and very tentatively uh, that a knowledge of what happened in the decades uh, after 1450 might encourage us to think uh, in new and exciting ways about the possibilities inherent uh, in digital uh, technology. I suppose that's because uh, in the move to digital uh, design, and in particular uh, e-books and readers, in the first generation uh, of those e-books and readers, uh, designers have naturally tried to make the digital as authentically book-like as a book. And I suppose that's quite natural, because one has to give people products that they understand and can comprehend. And it's quite obvious to us that if digital books uh, didn't look and feel like analogue books, uh, they would not uh, sell. If the new is recognisable uh, as uh, similar to uh, the old, uh, then it will sell. And, and I think the success of digital uh, and e-books over the past number of years has, has shown that designers have been very successful in setting out what they've tried to do and what they've had to do uh, in the first generation uh, of e-books. But I want to suggest that uh, this approach limits the possibilities of what digital books and typography could be, uh, not just in this generation of books or the next generation of books, and obviously a generation uh, of digital books seems to be about two and a half years rather than 25 years, uh, but what uh, books and typography could be in 10, 30, 50, or dare I even say it's 70 years. Uh, and I choose 70 because uh, with modern European copyright law, uh, 70 years is about the lifetime uh, of a legally protected uh, text in the European uh, Union. So we might use this opportunity to think about possibilities in the light of the actual enormous changes which took place in the 70 years after the invention uh, of movable type. And if we think about medieval manuscripts and manuscript uh, books, I think we can in, in very quickly give a number of characteristics uh, about them. They were uh, rare items, they were precious items, uh, they were uh, unique in themselves and they were uh, highly prized. Above all, they developed their own grammar, forms and conventions which identified them as manuscripts to uh, customers uh, and readers. And as you can see, there was a very uh, visual uh, look to them. The apparatus for navigating those uh, texts might not have been up to what we expect today, but there was a noticeably uh, visual uh, look. And uh, really what we're talking about then is when we move uh, to print uh, from the movement from the medieval uh, to the early modern, uh, and then the difference between the two periods. We're, we're talking about uh, something uh, epoch-changing, because for me, the move between medieval and early modern is nothing to do with battles or the passing of legislation, as history books uh, will traditionally define different uh, epochs. It's to do with the emergence, development, and spread uh, of a technology, the move from scribal publication to a communication based on movable type, easily and quickly reproduced on a common wooden hand press. 
Now, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, that statement would have been seen uh, as a political statement. It would have marked me out as a Marxist of some sort who believed that the economic uh, base uh, uh, predetermined and, and influenced uh, and affected uh, the cultural and intellectual superstructure of society. But I think in our day, in our more ideological, uh, in our less ideological and more technological age, uh, it seems like an unproblematic uh, statement, especially if we define our age by the appearance of a particular mode of communication, uh, electronic communication. And such a model uh, is handy as a grand uh, narrative, but we can't be too stringent, I think, uh, in its application, because there wasn't one seismic shift which changed things forever uh, and for always in a particular direction. And that's, I suppose, implicit in the idea of the printing revolution, that there's a huge seismic change uh, and that things are noticeably different uh, very quickly. Instead, uh, rather than being uh, a revolution uh, in typography and design, there were a plethora of inventions, innovations uh, and initiatives, many of which led down dead ends. So one couldn't map out in advance in 1450 when movable type uh, be began to be used first uh, in the West what effect the application of print would have. But one could look back from the vantage point of 1520 or 1530 and 1540 and describe a narrative of how things got to be uh, the way that they were. But I suppose uh, it's important to stress that it was a gradual process, a story of entrepreneurship, uh, innovation uh, and risk. And the key point for me uh, is that the book as we know it today and have known it for the past 400 years did not emerge uh, fully formed. Uh, it didn't spring forth from a live birth uh, or an egg. Instead, if I'm to labour the metaphor perhaps uh, too much, uh, it underwent a process of metamorphosis. But that metamorphosis was not achieved uh, in one step. Instead, the transformation was gradual, extended over a long period of time, and involved a number of intermediate steps. And in fact, in the years after the invention of print, one gets books that almost look more like manuscripts than manuscripts themselves. Uh, and this slide uh, makes the point. Uh, I've often uh, asked students to look at these and try to identify which of those items uh, are printed books from the years immediately after uh, Gutenberg's revolution and which are medieval uh, manuscripts. They're very, very similar, but the point is clear. They're similar because they have to be to entice, uh, to entice customers uh, in those decades. And the answer is that the top line, those three uh, items along the top, uh, are medieval manuscripts. The four items along the bottom uh, are early printed books from within 10 years, 20 years, actually 22 years uh, is the latest example, uh, 22 years after. Uh, 1450. Along the bottom right we have two images of the same page of the Gutenberg uh, Bible, one uh, on, in the centre printed on paper, uh, the one on the right printed uh, on vellum, uh, and in the bottom left hand corner the letters of Cicero from 1472. Uh, again it's terribly uh, ornate uh, and we're dealing with early modern printed books which are designed to look exactly uh, like uh, manuscripts. And it's only gradually uh, that things begin to change as uh, not so much authors, uh, but publishers realise that the new technology allowed certain features to be done away with uh, and certain other things to be invented and played around with uh, once they had uh, been invented. And to give you uh, an example, uh, this is 1493, uh, almost 50 years after the invention uh, of print, and we're dealing with something uh, unrecognisable to uh, our modern eyes. There's an attempt uh, at a title page uh, on the first image, and then there's a huge uh, block of text in Gothic. So we're still using the uh, ancient medieval uh, uh, text. Uh, and at the end, uh, on the right, uh, they're still using uh, the idea of uh, a medieval uh, colophon. By 1506, we're looking at a, a small uh, book here, uh, a book about uh, Aristotle. There's an attempt uh, at a title page. Uh, bizarrely for us in the centre, uh, publishers have decided that it would be a really good idea to put indexes at the front of the book. 
Uh, and then uh, on the right we can see uh, that there's a slight attempt at producing a title at the top of the book, but still the publisher, again more than 50 years after the first invention of print, is enthralled to the idea uh, of an initial letter. And the idea was that that blank space would have been uh, illustrated in the style of a medieval uh, manuscript, uh, more than uh, two generations of human life after uh, the first invention uh, of printing. This is uh, another uh, intermediary stage in which we might think from 1507 uh, that we're uh, moving on to something uh, noticeably uh, modern. Uh, we have on the left-hand side uh, what we might call uh, a title page uh, with an image of Jean Petit, uh, the, his, the image of his shop and an account of where you can buy it. Uh, you can see on the top there in the second image there is a dedication, uh, a poem and, an, and a dedication. Uh, we've moved towards some sort of use of the text uh, to, to try and make it more uh, readable. Uh, and at the end, we have uh, the index. But you can see on the bottom left-hand corner, the text is still inscribed in 1507 uh, using those uh, illuminated letters so common uh, from the uh, medieval period. And again, when 1510, we're looking at uh, a whole series of intermediary stages. An attempt at a title page, still uh, a huge uh, block of, of, of text, uh, largely uh, unreadable uh, to modernise. And then on the right, uh, something which looks very much like a medieval manuscript uh, as we'd uh, know it. And yet again, and the intermediary stages will finish in a minute, I assure you, uh, yet another uh, intermediary stage. Uh, we think we're moving uh, towards a title page here, a, a publisher's uh, mark uh, on the front. Uh, towards the uh, second image, though, we can see the, the type is, is much clearer, it's much more legible, but again, uh, they're enthralled to the medieval, medieval idea of illumination uh, and rubrication. Throughout the text, somebody has gone through uh, and highlighted uh, initial letters. Uh, and we have uh, the colophon, the details of printing and publishing, which we know uh, and we assume are always at the front, uh, are still uh, at the back uh, in those days. Uh, and even uh, close to 1520, we're dealing with something which uh, really, apart from the lack of illumination, hasn't really travelled uh, hasn't really travelled that far. Uh, in the previous uh, 60 years. And I suppose one of the first things that publishers realised that they could do with this uh, image, uh, with this new technology, is that they could, if they wanted, uh, dispense with uh, the expense and the trouble uh, of illumination. But uh, they also realised gradually, and it was fitful and there were uh, false starts uh, aplenty, but gradually you can trace a uh, process by which, uh, over a period of time, uh, publishers were able to work towards uh, modern title pages as we know it, a preparatory uh, matter, uh, navigational aids, some of which were invented, some of which were refined from medieval uh, practices, such as indexes, uh, footnotes, uh, and side notes. Uh, there was also uh, a move fitful at, at the first uh, from 1501 to produce uh, new fonts uh, and the Roman font that we're so familiar with is, is invented as you'll know, uh, many of you in 1501 uh, it, to fit into the new uh, idea of a printed book uh, to make it possible uh, to fit more letters uh, onto a page uh, and also uh, publishers begin to uh, experiment with uh, new formats uh, of books and new types of books uh, and new uh, genres but it is a very gradual uh, process so I want to suggest that uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish up now, but I want to suggest that uh, currently we're still very much uh, at the stage uh, on the left in which we think uh, that digital books, and, uh, digital books have to look like what we assume uh, printed books uh, will look like. And I know there are people here today who are uh, grasping towards what the next generation, uh, perhaps in the next five uh, and ten years, uh, will look like. Uh, of uh, digital books and, and e-printers uh, and e-readers. But I wonder whether it's uh, too optimistic to, to think about the changes over those 70 years between 1450 and 1520 and wonder if we can think about uh, an ideal type 
uh, of digital design uh, and electronic communication in 70 years uh, and begin to think and sketch out uh, what that would look like uh, and the steps that might be taken uh, over the coming years uh, to approach uh, beyond that. Uh, and I hate to finish with a cliché. Uh, but I will anyway, uh, and, and it's, uh, the horrible business speak cliché would be, in terms of blue sky thinking, uh, what would uh, a digital book uh, look like uh, in 70 uh, years. It will look, I would suggest, uh, as different uh, from what we have today uh, as those two images uh, on the screen in front of you uh, are uh, in those first generations uh, of early modern printing. Thank you.